Brian Chesky is um, an art school graduate and recent subject of a Tom Friedman column in the New York Times. Yeah. Um, John Donahoe is an economics major from Dartmouth, Stanford MBA, cut his teeth in years and years at Bain Consulting. Th on paper, these guys look like they wouldn't necessarily have a lot in common, but in fact, they have quite the mutual appreciation society, and more importantly, <laughs> they spend a lot of time learning from each other. So, John, how'd y'all meet? Well, um, you know, Mark Andreessen's a board member um, and a couple years ago, I asked Mark who the best founder in Silicon Valley was because I wanted to reach out. I felt like I had things we needed to learn about innovation and design. And he said Brian Chesky. It was, it was, he had an immediate answer. And so we had met each other once, but I, I called Brian and said, can I come buy a cup of coffee? And so I went up there at B&B's office and started just asking him how he approaches design, how he approaches innovation, how he approaches product. And I was furiously taking notes. We sat down for what was ended up being a couple hours, I think, on that, on that table. And I was learning an enormous amount. I learned, frankly, his definition of how he thinks about design is really relevant to our company because our companies are so similar. And then at the end of it, Brian says, ah, you don't get a way to do with that. I'll get to come pick your brain. And a couple weeks later, we had brunch. And so what's ended up happening is I've been, he's been my tutor or mentor on, on design, on innovation. It's turning out to be on a lot more in, uh, on, on how you run a more nimble company. And, and I think it's sort of worked a little bit yeah. reciprocally as well. Exactly. Were you surprised, Brian, when you got the call? Yeah. I, I, so one of the things I've always did, done is I imagined I'm as smart as the people I surround myself with. So I've always tried to seek out. Like a lot of people ask, how out of art school in five years do you learn how to become a CEO? And the answer is, well, you talk to CEOs. And you talk to people who have done the job. Um, and I've talked to num uh, numerous CEOs, but John was different than everyone else I talked to. Because everyone I talked to, I went to to get advice. And what they did is they gave me advice. Because they saw, they saw themselves as bigger, more successful, and more advanced. And so therefore, they knew something I didn't know, and they were there to teach me. John was completely the opposite. He was like, you know something that I don't know. And he was essentially trying to get as much information and knowledge out of me. And that was like the mutual mentorship or, that we have was unbelievable. But I think it's incredibly prescient because so many a company needs to be both nimble and robust. And if you aren't both, you'll eventually die in the technology industry. And so us, we're nimble, we're innovative, but we have to become a robust company. We've got to scale. We want to be one of the next great marketplaces like eBay. Well, John's done that. So if there's one person in the world to talk to, it's John. Well, John is, wants to build a 100-year company, but the problem with these technology companies, they're in worlds where people like us are coming around, and we're changing the game every few years. And so he has to completely be dialed into what's new. And I think he's really smart. And we, history has shown so many different companies who they thought they knew everything, they thought the world would never change, and look what happened. So John, what's, if you could distill it, what are a couple of the best things that you've learned from talking to Brian? Well, just how he defines design. You know, most people, when you think about design, think about the pixels. And, you know, Brian said to me, he said, look, people spend less than 5% of their experience on the Airbnb experience. So the design of the user experience on the site or mobile app itself may be important, but it's only a small piece of the equation. He said to me, John, what's important is design thinking, bringing a systematic approach to how you design a great experience for your customers end to end. And if you think about it, they've got an incredible challenge the full end, the whole full Airbnb end to end design experience. But it's not that different from the eBay it's not, experience. It's not. And he took me. He took me. He took me. I guess it was upstairs at that time. And um, and they have these frames. He calls it the frames of the customer's experience. They're 15 frames, yeah. and only one was the site experience. And and so just a systematic ro way he's thinking about design and design thinking. And what I've done is shamelessly stolen everything I can, yeah. the concept, the ideas. And we're trying to inject these more into eBay. And because, again, we, as you said, we have a very similar, similar experience. So if I went to eBay's site today, is there something that I might be able to look at that is a direct result of the conversations you've had with Brian or that reflects the ethos that he's shared with you? Um, yes. About the same time, what we have over the last really six to, to, to 10 months we've implemented what we're calling voice of the customer. Um, and it's called voice of the customer rapid response where we are, and it's not anything on the site itself, but we have rapid cycle teams. We have dedicated rapid cycle teams that every time there's an inbound problem, a bug, uh, uh, something that about that, the post transaction experience, 
we have a dedicated team who's fixing it. And Brian's systematic approach of design thinking and the whole end-to-end -end consumer experience. He talks about a seven-star experience. I mean, this is just what I love. Yeah, and a five-star. There's only five stars. It, what would the imaginary six or seven-star look like? It goes to seven. And, and Brian talks about having a seven-star experience. And I went back and said, if we had a seven-star experience, what would that look like? And that's a question I wouldn't have asked until before I met Brian. So it, it's, he's having, and, you know, I had him come to our board meeting. I had him come to our leadership team. He spoke to the top 200. So it's been an enormous source of education and learning for our, our organization and been a lot of fun. Same question for you, Brian. If you could distill it, what are the things that you've learned from John that have proven most valuable? So, I mean, our relationship probably started around this time last year. And I remember I actually came and I spoke here at Fortune about a year ago. At that time, I did not have an executive team. In fact, I was still trying to figure out what exactly an executive team was and what it did and how do you function with one. And we have been through crazy growth. Um, a few, only two years before that point, we were working out of a three-bedroom apartment. And I realized one day I woke up and we had like four or 500 people. We didn't have a team of executives. And so what ended up happening was I was just under leverage. I would be in meetings about like what kind of, like the most minute, minute details. And there were like tens of thousands of tiny decisions I was getting pulled into. And I didn't really feel like I had the time in my day and I didn't feel like I had leverage. And I was trying to understand how do I build a team to give me leverage and grow and scale? I didn't really know how to scale a company. And I talked to a number of different people, but when I met John, the amazing thing is you can meet a lot of people, but you want to make sure the advice you get is relevant to you and is contemporary. So there are some kind of universal things. Somebody's run a company 20 years ago, or they've run a company in the advertising industry. But how lucky could I be to find somebody in my market, a marketplace, contemporary, real lessons right now. And I talked to John about what do I need to look for in a CFO. He actually helped me recently with a new um, organization we have for operations and how do I centralize operations and lean out the team. What do I need in different functions? How do I run a team? How do I manage a board? All these things I never even thought about. Because when you start a company, you don't think about the business. You don't think about the company. You think about the product. All you care about is the product and the users. And what happens is, is a lot of founders are product centric. They're either designers or engineers. And they're trying to build a product. Well, before your eyes, you have a company, and that company has to be managed. And at some point, you can't manage the product. You have to manage the company that manages the product. And John is probably the best person I've ever met to do that. And I've, we've been, I've been able to meet a lot of great people. Right. But John reached out to you. So what do you think might have happened had you not met him? I mean, how would you have solved or addressed all those problems? I know it's a little bit of a, a weird question, but. Would you, I, I think, you know, as a founder, you, you eventually learn everything, but it's time. It's like, how many mistakes will I make and how much time is it going to take before I actually figure that out? And the, old, the, the biggest enemy of a founder is time because you're growing so quickly and you can't afford to turn late. So John really, I think, helped me circumvent so many different issues around a management team, showed me how to upscale the team, how to manage meetings. I mean, even really difficult things, like if an employee's not working out, how do you tell them? And how do you work with them and do it in a really humane way? Like, there's just things I didn't know how to manage. I don't know how to do, do. The things I do on a daily basis, I almost learned nothing at art school to do that. In fact, even growing up in high school. And I can't call my parents and ask them, so who, at some point, who do you call? And I, have, I do have some <laughs> other great advisors. I mean, Jeff Jordan's on our board. And, um, I think Dan Rosenzweig's here as well, and he's amazing. So I, I try to make sure I have a, a, like a circle of like three or four or five people that I'm constantly pinging for advice. But the thing about John is that he's a contemporary CEO running a company right now in a marketplace. There's only one of those in the world. I, I, let me, and I know it's just sound like the Mutual Admiration Society, believe it or not, it's legitimate. Um, but what makes Brian unique is he's constantly trying to learn. He, he has multiple mentors, I think. And, and he's, he, he is a learning animal, and he learns from Jeff on his board. He was learning a lot from Dan in the green room. <laughs> um, and, and I have other people I'm learn, trying to learn innovation from. What ended up happening is this just clicked. And so we ended up talking, you know, it's probably every other week. We end up, hey, how do you think about this? Or hey, how do you think about that? And it's and real in time. every interaction, yeah. right? I feel I've like I've got a problem, I'm gonna call John. John's yeah. got an issue. And it's distinct from somebody on your board. I mean, those relationships are incredibly important, but there's an informality and there's a matter of like neither of us have any stake in the other's success. That is actually really important to be truly candid and it's like it's just it's not even being candid, it's like you don't have a stake, so you don't have a lens. Like your lens is completely, you have no agenda, you have no opinion, no personality about it, and that's been incredibly important. And now when I meet other CEOs or founders, and I have a lot of like friends running companies similar sizes, I recommend the same thing to them. And everyone wants to get to know like Larry Page or somebody, but I say you should find somebody who is actually more of a match with your business. And frankly, 
wants to also learn from you and wants to spend time with you. And not every, like every CEO wants to spend time with Larry Page or Jeff Bezos. Those are the names that keep coming up. Um, but everyone wants to spend time with them. But you should find somebody who like, you can also give back to and is a good cultural fit. And us, like, we have a great relationship and a friendship. And I think it's like the friendship has to be as important as what you're trying to get out of it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. There's like, at the end of the day, there's a trust here. Yeah. And I think that's hard to find. And just to reiterate, y'all are not on each other's boards. No. no. But John, you at one point considered putting Brian on your board. Why, why did you well, not go that way? To be honest, it was one of the things I was thinking early on. It's like, oh, it'd be great to get Brian on, on our board because we need to inject more design. Um, he understands innovation. The businesses are so similar. I actually had him come speak to our board. Um, and you didn't know that. It was partly to get the board to meet you. <laughs> but then as I sat there, I thought, you know what? I'm going to get more impact and value from having Brian not be on our board than be on our board. Because he can sit in board meetings, and, but half the board meetings would be not relevant things. And he's an incredibly, he's running what will be the most successful startup, I think, of this generation. I mean, their growth rates, you know, J Jeff Jordan's here, who's, who's on, who, who was at eBay at the beginning, and he's on the Airbnb board, and said the growth rates are at or above what eBay's were. So, so Airbnb has a, a future that is, that is stunning. And to take him away from that, make him sit in some of our board meetings, didn't seem right. And we were getting... 80, 90% of the value just through our informal in, in communication. At, in our stage, everything's about execution. I, um, last, uh, I, I was meeting, I met with uh, Jeff Bezos last week, and I had a similar conversation with him, and he basically, at the end of the conclusion, he said, this company's gonna be massively successful as long as you don't fuck it up. And I was like, well, why would we fuck it up? He's like, well, you've got to execute. And he, we talked a lot about that. And I, that's one of the things I've talked to John about is that like, our business is now known. We're in an industry rivaling the size of the oil industry. Travel is huge, another great marketplace. It's all about execution. It's all about focus. And for people in our position, it's easy for founders to like, crash and burn. Like, you know, you've got to be really, really focused. And I think there's like, a humility that like, the people that don't, aren't successful are just they don't have the right advisors around them and the right kind of coaches and mentors. I'm not going to ask, put you on the spot and ask you who's a better advisor, John Donahoe or Jeff Bezos. But um, Jeff, I, John, I am going to put you on the spot. Uh, you acquire a lot of small upstart companies. Have you considered acquiring Airbnb? Oh, we couldn't afford it. We'd love to. Your valuation is about $2.5 billion? Uh, no comment. <laughs> no. I mean, I mean, it seems know. like it would be a great fit. Yeah, but, but the innovation that Brian's driving, I mean, this is going to be a standalone business. I mean, you can look at certain startups and certain businesses and say, some of them will get to certain stages and, and will, will flatten out. Other ones have network effects potential that is just extraordinary. And Airbnb, Airbnb is one of those companies. It'll be the next eBay. Airbnb will be the next eBay, and, and I, I firmly believe it. And, and watching Brian drive it and grow it is just extraordinary. Yeah, and like, again, like all of this comes back to can we execute? And so you start to ask, well, why won't Airbnb do that? And you ask, well, because we won't execute. Well, who's responsible for executing? Me. So what are the challenges I may have? Well, one, two, three, four, five. John, how do you deal with those? I mean, you can literally deconstruct whether or not we'll be successful back to our conversations and whether or not we make the right decisions. And with him, I mean, with John, eBay is a massive company. And I think the biggest risk to any company like eBay is that they... For every company like eBay, there's another Airbnb in a living room somewhere doing something really, really interesting. And like again, you, you, I, you have to be robust and nimble. And I think there's so many stories of companies that they're nimble, they become robust, and the problems become tankers. And as they're robust, they stop moving quickly. And I think the biggest indicator of whether a company's going to get disrupted is whether the CEO is a learner or a knower. And so if the CEO knows everything, then they're not going to be successful. And you probably saw this with like, the media industry. Like, How could they be blindsided by this next movement? But John's not going to be blindsided. And that's the thing that's so great is because he's talking to me and all these other CEOs and founders of younger companies. And we're constantly telling him. But I can tell you with a for a fact that I've met with many other CEOs who are kind of just teaching me or they don't get it. And they're not really interested in what's happening. I mean, they were ahead of mobile even before we were. It's amazing. And you know, we're, we grew up in the mobile generation. You know, Stephanie, one of the things that I think is beginning to happen in this is, based on these kinds of interactions, what, we're, what I'm discovering is that founders bring a unique set of capabilities to drive innovation. And, and so, it's part of, partly driven by our conversations, we've now acquired about 20 startups over the last three years. And we've got, I think by recent count, 15 founders still working at eBay. And they're driving huge levels of innovation. And they get, our value proposition is you get to innovate at scale. 
you get to bring that kind of, founders have incredible clarity of direction, often they're great at product and design, and they, they have, they, they're nimble and they know how to drive execution faster, they have a faster cycle time. And so I think part of what's happening both in our conversations and what's happening in the Valley is a bridging between the best of the small companies and the best of the large companies. And they tend to get polarized. The narrative in Silicon Valley is you're either a startup or a big company. And the reality is I think certainly big companies can learn a lot from startups and can benefit from founders. And I think the reciprocal is probably true for the most yeah. successful startups which are gonna scale. None of us, like Pablo Casa had a saying, the bigger you get, the stronger the wind gets, and it's always in your face. None of us want to become the thing we're trying to disrupt. So the last thing I want to do is build a big kind of company be, like, that I want to disrupt, because when we were small, we hated big companies that were irrelevant. And the same thing, that was never Pierre's vision at eBay, and that's not what John's going to build. And I think one of the things that makes the Silicon Valley work so well, and I'm not sure other industries work this way, is none of us have a zero-sum mentality. Right. And I bet you if this was... I don't know, maybe Hollywood or New York or some other industry, like there'd be this, maybe this notion that for you to win, I have to lose. And I think one of the things that the Valley is, when I came up here, I came up here literally with nothing. I had $1,000 at the bank. I put everything in the back of a Honda Civic. And everyone in the Valley was here to help me. And every step of the way, whether it's John or Jeff, Dan, others here, like they're all here to help. And um, I think the reason, beca that's because we're all in hyper growth. It's like you can imagine there's so much growth ahead of us that there's, n there's no pie. The pie can just continue to grow. And I, would, I, guess, I guess the thought I would have is I would tell like, a lot of other entrepreneurs, like, just try to help more people and try to get more help. Um, because I think ultimately we make each other stronger because we're not really competing with each other. We're competing with essentially the status quo. And, and my version of the same, what I would tell our big company CEOs is pay attention to what's going on with the disruptive innovators. Because there's something real here. It's easy to dismiss it and write it off. But there's something real, it's fundamental, and it's different. But it's also easy to say, yeah, yeah, I understand there's disruptors. I'm going to go and do five meetings with disruptors every month and then not really take in or understand that information. What do you think is the key to really opening your eyes and ears to what the disruptors are, are, are telling you? Well, in my case, i got to feel like I really need it. So it's being paranoid, compulsive, um, and scared to death that if we don't innovate faster, if we don't keep driving innovation and going to the next level of innovation inside of our company, we're not gonna continue to succeed and thrive. And so every, every conversation I'm having with Brian is one where I'm, I'm not just asking him stuff because I, it's intellectually interesting, it's because we need to learn, we need to grow. That's why I brought him to speak in front of my top, our, 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 our global VP group, it's our top 200 people because I wanted them to hear this because it's so important for our to be successful. And, and we have, we've, we, we've injected more innovation inside of eBay and we've, I'm, I'm proud of what we've done over the last five, six years, but we've got to go to the next level. And so, so it, 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 I, I think to really listen and have it to be authentic, it's got to feel very real and everything, everything that I'm getting from Brian is very real and very applicable for what we do. Yeah. We're gonna go to questions from the audience in a few minutes. Brian, you recently, um, said that you're going to be rethinking your international strategy a little bit. Can you tell us what the thinking is around international now and what advice and conversations you had with Brian around that? Yeah, um, John is actually very, very helpful in, having me think, uh, in helping me think through that. Essentially, two years ago, we had a company of 40 or 50 people and this uh, the Samware brothers came around, cloned our company, raised $90 million and said they were going to do this huge international expansion, we realized we had to grow pretty quickly because we felt like a global travel site that wasn't global was like a phone without email. It wasn't gonna be very, very useful. And the Samware brothers, I'm sure everyone in the room knows, but they're famous for squatting on ideas started somewhere else yeah. and then. And so we had to grow really, really quickly and we continued, we scaled out a home shored custom support model, which coincidentally is what eBay <laughs> did in the early days. They had people working from home and we ended up having people in 80, 100 locations around the world and we separately opened up over a dozen offices around the world. And over the last couple of years, we've been able to pull away from our competitors and we started thinking, what is the really sustainable organization we want to build? And a few thoughts we had. One of the things was we wanted to go from being proactively reaching out to people and introducing them to the website, because a lot of people now know what Airbnb is, to actually building in the customer experience. In fact, one of the things we did is, and I, like, I always talk to John about this, is 
The simplest thing to do, and Paul Graham actually wrote an essay about this recently, is don't work on the product, work on making the experience amazing for the users you already have. And so create an make it like an imaginary screenplay of what the perfect experience would be on your website. And just make that. And that's, we called, we, our code word for that was Snow White. Because it was modeled after Snow White, which was the first feature length animation movie that used the storyboards. And so like create uh, the perfect storyboard. And then have a different set of team operationalize the perfect experience. And we started realizing there were so many different things we should be doing for people internationally. And John helped us think through how we bring people together in different offices. And so ultimately created what I think is going to be a leaner and more effective organization that's even more focused on service. And they were one of the original adopters in Net Promoter Score. And in the early days, we were obsessed with how much people loved Airbnb, but we weren't super um, sophisticated in our analytics. And you know, they were really, I think, the ones that bring that to popularity. Right. So there's obviously some hard choices involved in going leaner in international. John, did you offer any advice on how to restructure? Well, I, all I could do is I could, I could speak to our experience at eBay and then my experience in, in, in business. So yes, growing a global, going global is hard. It takes a decade. And growing a global organization and decisions about what you do locally versus regionally versus on a more global basis, how you recruit and hire talent, which is things that I'd had experience with. You know, I'm just sitting here thinking that the other thing that, that, that happens here, you know, we keep referencing Jeff, who is such a, is, and, and, and Dan, who happens to be in the audience as well. There, Jeff was at eBay early on, is now on the, on, the, on the Airbnb board. So there's a lot of cumulative learning here and the ability to share what worked and what didn't and vice versa, what Brian's doing that we aren't, is there's kind of a network effect here of, 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 of sharing and learning that's, that's kind of fun, and it, yeah. it, benefits, it benefits both. And I've always viewed that I'll be as successful as the humility I have to continue to take advice from people that have been where I hope to be one day, and this is an example of that. So when people talk about Airbnb as the next eBay, you don't think I could be even bigger than eBay? Well, I think does. that. <laughs> of course, he does. And I think John. Th I well, hope so. John thinks obviously, and I think that eBay could be much bigger than what it is today. I think that this is literally um, day two of the internet, as Jeff Bezos said ten years ago, and it's still day two because we've got hundreds of years in front of us of something incredibly interesting. So. I mean, we compete in a ten trillion dollar market, and we enabled two hundred billion dollars of commerce last year. So there's a lot of runway, a lot of runway. And the travel industry is, depending upon who you ask around two to six trillion dollars, depending on how you size it. The oil industry is about four trillion. So there's plenty of market here for us. And we obviously believe that for us to win, no one else has to lose. Now, there's a lot of industries in which that's not the case. Yeah. If you're a restaurant in a certain town, maybe like the customer's going to go to one restaurant or the other. But we are sufficiently different. Uh, let's go to the audience for some questions. Uh, I'm going to hold off on Mr. Schrag for one moment to see if there's a question from elsewhere. Boy, it's all the journalists. Any, uh, any participants who want to want to jump in here? Okay, um, we'll go to Michael Schrag, uh, risers on the far end there, and then after that, Miguel Helft right in front of him. You guys clearly like each other and respect each other enormously, but we want to know what's the best argument you guys are having right now. We're having any arguments? I don't think of. Hell no. <laughs> you know. I I don't know. I don't think we argue that much. I'll tell you, here's how. We, so here's a funny story. We were literally in, in the green room, and Jeff and Dan were out there, and we were talking about an organization um, change Brian's contemplating. And I was saying what I thought. And I said to Dan, well, what do you think? And, and Jeff walked up, and I said, well, Jeff, what do you think? And Jeff disagreed with Dan, and they started a debate. And here you got this former COO of Yahoo bringing his experience. You got Jeff bringing his experience. I'm throwing in mine. I don't know, and, and I don't know if you call it a debate or an argument, but it's a debate. Those two and then Brian, Brian gets to choose, you know, there's 10% of that, 5% of it is in, insightful. And so, so it's less arguing, it's more how do you spark, because there's not right answers for many of these things. Well, plus like we're not like, we, the, re, the other reason is probably not a lot of arguing is we kind of view each other as a, source of wisdom for the other's topics, which we want to learn from. So I'm not going to argue with him about management. He's probably not going to argue with me about innovation. It's going to you know, give his perspective. And then he's going to decide. It's more a matter of you're going to decide what to listen to and not to listen to. And when I, the other thing is, and this is a great example, is I think that like all great like 
my rec, I don't know, I wouldn't know what to give advice to necessarily give to a, 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 an executive CEO of a really large company, but for any founder running a company, I would say you should have, they call different names, like a CEO council. And you should have five people, typically, but it can be like whatever the number should be. And I think you should have one person, and just take your businesses. So for my business, I try to have John help me as far as like how to be a CEO. Like, being a CEO is a distinct job. It's got specific responsibilities, and no one ever teaches them. The problem is that there's no appreciation for learning how to be a CEO. Your employees coming to work aren't appreciating the fact that every day you're learning. They don't appreciate that. They, I mean, they do, but ultimately they have needs, and you need to deliver, and you cannot have a learning curve. The learning curve can be very expensive. So John became that person for me, and I have other people as well that help me with like um, marketing and other things as well. And I try to imagine. You know, like, the movie, this wonderful movie, Jiro, Dream Sushi, says, like, to eat great food, you must, or to be a great chef, you must eat the best food. To be great at anything in the world, you must meet the best in the world. So I ask myself, who's the best CEO in the world? Who's the best professional CEO in the world that is going to be amazing at the things I'm not good at? And John, having come from Bain and, like, really scaled eBay and run it, is literally the um, archetype of the, like, a true world-class CEO that knows how to manage. And then you try to go point by point. And then, so for design, I've, you know, Talked to some designers from Apple, and so for marketing, I talked to like Michael Ovitz, and like, for trust and safety, I talked to George Tenet. But like John has become like essentially like more like the CEO coach. So, and, and one of the things you know, Stephanie, I think that we were just talking about this earlier today. That is true. That um, I go and I, I I go to Brian for innovation, and I go to I go to other other CEOs that I've learned a lot from around scaling. I go to Jeff Elmold or Sam Palmasano or Jamie Dimon are are CEOs I admire enormously. And what is true about them, and I think what is true about the most successful CEOs, and is true about the most successful founders, is it's a continuous learning process. That to some extent, the biggest fear I have is am I the bottleneck? Am I not learning fast enough to keep up with the company? And this notion, it's not really talked a lot about, about how important the, 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 it is to learn and to keep learning. And the minute you think you've got something figured out, it's changing. And, yeah, you can literally like, create a curve of growth. And the curve is how fast your company's growing. And the next curve is how fast are you as a CEO growing? And are you growing like this, in which case the company's out scaling you and the company's pulling you? Are you growing at the speed or are you growing ahead of it? You always want to be hopefully growing faster in the company, so you're pulling the company essentially around the corner into the future. But you can't do that if you don't know how to do basics of a company, in my case. Or in his case, sure. you're not going to know if you don't know like, kind of what technology is around the corner. Right. right. Um, Miguel? And then we have a question down here in the front after that. Uh, John, the story of a big valley company trying to bring the startup spirit in-house is, is pretty common. You're doing it with, with Brian. You also done it with, um, you bought, uh, I think it's Zong, David yeah. Marcus's company, and then pretty soon you promoted him to be the president of uh, PayPal. I'm sure he's done great things at PayPal. When I talk to the, the next generation of payment startups and you ask them about PayPal and innovation, they roll their eyes or worse. So, And, and I'm sure, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not fully uh, um, justified, but once you bring somebody in like that, how do you keep that, that spirit, how do you make sure that that doesn't get stifled, that it keeps uh, giving what you're trying to get, which is this nimbleness and, and innovation? Yeah, well, the, the example Miguel's talking about is we bought Zong, which was run by David Marcus, three-time founder and entrepreneur, who is a fantastic product and design guy. And, and, and um, so, he had never managed more than 200 people in his career, but I felt that PayPal really needed a sharp injection of great product, great design, great injection of user experience, and David exudes that. So put him in charge, and that's in charge of 12,000 people. And he's doing a fantastic job of really bringing that spirit of innovation, of the consumer user experience back into PayPal. And that'll take time, and PayPal's doing all right in the interim. You know, you're always scared of disruption. You always got to pay attention to it. But PayPal has, has some enormous advantages, like 130 million active users processing, you know, 150 billion dollars of volume. It's literally the growing 29 percent. But um, we are still. Are, you've talked to David here. He would still say, "I'm. We want to inject more innovation and ex accelerate the pace of innovation at PayPal. Part of that we're doing organically, and part of that we'll, we'll we will acquire." You know, smaller companies that are that are driving innovation. I think certain innovations can be best done in startups, and I think other innovations, larger companies like ours, can drive centrally. But what's powerful is when you take a founder and say, "Here's your opportunity to innovate at scale. 
here's the opportunity to take your vision, to take your idea, to take your concept, and apply it instantaneously to 130 million users globally. And that's a really compelling value proposition for, for founders. So, you know, we got a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased with the progress David's making and, and uh, very optimistic. For whatever it's worth, um, I am, I'm friends with a um, number of the up and coming startups in the payment space, Stripe and um, Balance and a number of other ones. I think what they have going for them is they're incredibly nimble, but what the PayPal is going for is it's incredibly robust. And you can't really, like, you know, you, you've got to always n understand, like, we as small nimble companies always want to compete on being nimble, but being robust is incredibly important. And I'm actually incredibly impressed. Like, I think what he's done with Dave has been pretty amazing. Like, the culture is entirely changing at PayPal. And I think in a good way, I think it's definitely centered more around innovation. Time for one more quick question. Um, stand up and identify yourself, please. Thanks, Stephanie. Laura Lauder, Lauder Partners. So my question to you is, has to do with Tom's article. So it, had, it, it described how your company is promoting and fomenting trust. What a wonderful thing. Now, very different from eBay, where you're buying and selling products, you're buying and selling bedrooms. So my question to you is, how do you inculcate that spirit of trust and encourage that? One Tylenol product scare could you know, really harm your business. So how do you ensure that? So um, when we started the company, this was something that I wasn't sure if anyone would do this. And one of the things we thought was there were a couple tenants that would make this product work. The first was design. I think our background is design. Design instills trust, and it creates an emotion for you. The second was we wanted to live in a world without anonymity. And so we wanted to remove the anonymity from the transaction. We felt like if you knew the history of every single person, you can understand who you're transacting with. And recently, we've offered verified ID, where we verify the identification cards of every single one of our users. Um, we're, we're rolled out to about 25% in the US. And so I think over history, the platform becomes more and more trusted. And in fact, we've, like, the thing that surprises most people is not how many times this is a problem, but how many times this, what, this works. We have a million dollar insurance claim that we've had for essentially almost two years now on our platform. We've never had anything close to that claim. We've had tens of millions of nights booked through our website. So I think ultimately the first thought is that we are much, we're much larger than most hotel chains as far as the amount of volume we're doing. This is not a new idea. We didn't invent the idea of staying in a bedroom. And in fact, if you look at the roots of the hotel industry, they actually start with people staying in bedrooms, boarding houses, a third to half of people. The United States used to stay in boarding houses in the last century. So I don't think we're inventing a new idea here. Um, but I think trust in design and removing anonymity really, really helps. And I think it's an interesting note to end on this whole notion of trust, because clearly there's a trust that exists between these two executives that may ultimately be the linchpin of, of why this relationship works. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking John Donahoe, CEO of eBay, and Brian Chesky, CEO of Airbnb. Thank you, Armour.